Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday, TGIF. The sun is out today, but it's very, very cold. Very, very, very cold. Um, but God bless our farm and God bless all of you guys wherever you are today. Um, we're going to get rolling right away because uh, I have um, to leave here by 11 for a funeral. So, hang on. There we go. Nope, not that one. Uh, where did, there we go. Okay. So we'll start out with our morning affirmations. I am important. Today is going to be a great day. The world needs me. Today I choose happiness. I believe in myself. Today is a fresh and new start. Today I will do my best. And today and every day, God loves me and I am his child. Praise the Lord for that, my friends. Um, so yes, thanks for joining me today. Um, we have some prayers here that we need to get out because prayers are just so, so important. Prayers continue to go out for Wayne Vegan from the Adams area. Um, last I heard, he was um, still in the cities um, with an infection. So keep the prayers going for him and Deanne and the family. Um, Prayers go out to the friends and family of Harlan Bierke um, that passed away, which we have the funeral today at 1 o'clock in Adams with visitation an hour before. Um, prayers go out for Marianne Lindell and family. Um, and prayers go out for Carol Borgen and her family with the loss of her uncle. Um, and I just wanted to send prayers out to Sydney. Uh, I think it's Portier. He's an actor. And I just seen on my phone that he died at the age of 94. Lots of great movies came from his acting um, for many, many years. Um, and then, of course, our regulars, Margaret, Barb, um, Cole, Holden, um, and all of the folks um, that are getting treatment. Um, uh, Chris Greenwicher, uh, Jim Berg um, from the New London Spicer area, um, and God knows everybody that needs his loving arms wrapped around him. Um, and so, let's see here. Um, I do have a really neat act of kindness that came from Carla Mack, which is Holden's mom. Um, our friend we've been praying for that was in that terrible car accident that started on fire. And she says, a woman named Peggy that I spoke with today at the state, I found out she has ties to this area. And when I told her of Holden's accident, she asked if she could pray for our family. She said she keeps a list of people and between calls, she prays for them and their situations. She made me cry as that is one of the nicest things I have ever heard. It sure is, Carla, it sure is. God bless her. Let me see if I can let Buddy out here. Want to go outside, Buddy? So I do not want you bothering me here, okay? There you go. It's cold outside. It is cold outside. Okay, so let us all start out in prayer, my friends. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all past, present, and future blessings. We ask that you wrap your loving arms around all those that are struggling in any kind of way, dear Father. And please hear our prayers for all those mentioned today and, of course, all those in our minds and hearts that are not mentioned here today. We pray uh, that we absorb this message um, today from Ezra and Nehemiah and use the lessons that we can learn in our daily life. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh, man. Okay, guys, so I'm going to get rolling here because we have a lot, of course, because we're doing two books. So we're going to start with Ezra. Um, we'll do a little recap before we get into the lessons. Um, now, this book is named after the main character of its second part. And the book of Second Chronicles, if you remember, ended with an official message that King Cyrus of Persia sent in 538 BC, which allowed the Jews to return to their land and to rebuild the Lord's temple. 
So the first part of book, uh, the book of Ezra, chapters one through six, begins with that same message and then tells how many of the Jews returned to Jerusalem and began work on the temple. But the people in nearby areas caused a lot of trouble, as we heard. Um, and so the work went slowly and even stopped for several years. But the temple was finally finished in 515 B.C. The first part of the book also tells about problems at a later time when the Jews had to stop rebuilding the city walls during the rule of Artaxerxes. Now the second part of Ezra, chapter 7 through 10, begins with Ezra arriving in Jerusalem to teach God's laws to the people of Judah. Ezra was horrified to learn that the people of Israel were committing to the same sins as the other nations. Israel was in serious danger of being punished or even destroyed by the Lord. So Ezra prayed and confessed Israel's sins, and the people agreed to begin obeying God's laws. The book of Nehemiah reports other things that Ezra did as well. God's people were no longer an independent nation, but Ezra realized that God was in control no matter what empire ruled over them. And so here's a quote from Ezra. Praise the Lord God, our ancestors. He made sure that the king honored the Lord's temple in Jerusalem. God has told the king, his advisors, and his powerful officials to treat me with kindness. The Lord God has helped me. I have been able to bring many Jewish leaders back to Jerusalem. Ezra was a faithful one, my friends. So here are some lessons that we can learn from the book of Ezra. Oh, excuse me. First of all, in Ezra 1, verses 1 through 4, um, a kept promise. Many years before this time, the prophet Jeremiah had predicted that God's people would be in captivity for 70 years. Now, King Cyrus was beginning to complete that prophecy. Cyrus was not a Jew. Yet God caused this ruler to be a special part of God's plan for his people. God kept his promise to return his people to their homeland. We hear this over and over again, no matter what. God often uses people in events that we would not suspect of being able to help us. A teacher, a boss, a coach. Uh, a judge or government, government official may be God's means of speaking directly to us. Often, the people involved may not even know that God is using them in that way. But when we are open to hearing the Lord and seeing him at work, we see how vast God's reach is. Oh, excuse me, guys, sorry. Okay, sorry about that, but I'm, I'm getting better day by day. Next, um, we hear that the enemy doesn't um, fight fairly, and that comes from Ezra 4, verses 7 through 24. Now, in this passage, Ezra gives us a summary of the opposition to the Jews rebuilding the temple. Israel's enemies wrote letters to the king and to Xerxes, making it sound as though they... Um, had the king's best interests at heart. As a result, the king ordered the Jews to halt their work on the temple. Although the information given to the king was true, it was not fair to assume that this group of Israelites would rebel as their ancestors has done. But the enemy does not fight fairly. We should not be discouraged when those who oppose our work try to dig up something from our past in an attempt to stop what God wants to do. When the enemy wins a temporary victory, remember that this is only a delay, my friends, not a defeat, because God knows what's best. Next, we find God's people find favor in Ezra 6, 1-15. Not only did King Darius command Governor Tetirnai to stop hindering the work on the temple, but he actually told the governor to use public taxes to pay for the work, 
With the help of King Darius, the temple was completed in only four years. In our day, we are often tempted to think that the government and religion should be completely separate. But God can use the state to help complete his work when and where he wants to do so. Next, from Ezra 7, 1 through 28, help from the world. What a happy time for God's people here. They who had been slaves recently were now treated like royalty by the secular government. How can we account for the unusual kindness King Artaxerxes showed the Israelites? Did the Persian king worship God? We see the immense generosity of um, Artaxerxes and his concern that God's laws must be obeyed by everyone. In his own way, God controls rulers. What a comforting fact to keep in mind as we live in today's world. Absolutely. And last, a prayer for forgiveness in Ezra 9, 5 through 15. Now, Ezra's prayer is one of the best examples in the Bible of how to pray when we have sinned. Even though Ezra himself had not married a foreign woman, he included himself in the Israelites' failure to obey God. By tearing his clothes, he was outwardly expressing the sorrow he felt because of the people's sins. Ezra recognized that if God gave them what they deserved, he would have to destroy them all. Similarly, we may not have committed all the awful sins of which our society is guilty of. We can, however, confess our own sins as well as the sins of society to God. We can proclaim God's loving fairness and trust that he will be compassionate toward us. So here is a promise for us from Ezra. Now when Cyrus, the Persian emperor, offered the Israelites in Babylon the chance to return to Jerusalem and rebuild their shattered culture, most of them stayed, um, stayed put in their comfortable Babylonian homes. Instead of cities and villages, those who returned found weed choked, piles of rubble and neighbors who opposed their every move. The Israelites who went home soon grew discouraged and wanted to give up, but God wouldn't let them. He sent reinforcements in the persons of Haggai and Zechariah, two prophets, and Ezra, who emphasized the laws of God. The big winners in life, my friends, are those who dare to keep starting over. Ezra is a straightforward record of people who seized an opportunity to make a difference for God in an indifferent world. Now notice how God continually provides resources for people who dare, but he doesn't do the work for them. Mm -hmm. Now we move into the book of Nehemiah. We'll do just a brief overview here. Now 12 years after the last events of the book of Ezra, a Jew named Nehemiah received bad news about Jerusalem the walls of the city were still broken down and burned gates had never been replaced. Nehemiah lived in the Persian city of Susa and was a personal servant of King Artaxerxes. So Nehemiah prayed and asked God to have Artaxerxes send him to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. And Artaxerxes did send Nehemiah and he even provided the materials for the repairs. Now, after Nehemiah had arrived in Jerusalem and the repair work had begun, the officials from neighboring areas insulted the Jews and accused them of wanting to rebel against Persia. These enemies even planned attacks against Jerusalem and tried to have Nehemiah killed. Finally, though, the walls and gates were finished and dedicated to God, and they became a sign that God had blessed his people. But Nehemiah realized that God would continue to bless his people only if they obeyed him. As Nehemiah said in one of his prayers, Lord God of heaven, you are, a gr you are great and fearsome, and you faithfully keep your promises to everyone who loves you and obeys your commands. Now what I get out of that, my friends, is nobody can stop God's plans for you. So we move into the lessons here in Nehemiah 2 verses 1 through 10, a bold request. Now any unusual action or appearance on Nehemiah's part may have caused the king 
to suspect Nehemiah um, was afraid when he realized his outward appearance had revealed his inner sadness. When the king offered to help, Nehemiah quickly prayed for the Lord's guidance and then asked the king for help. We can't help but admire Nehemiah's boldness. God asks us all to be bold, my friend. A few minutes before he was fearing for his life, and now he boldly asks the king to give him letters ensuring his safe travel, as well as timber to rebuild Jerusalem's gate and the city wall. Not only did the king give Nehemiah everything he wanted, but the king made him governor of Judah. Sometimes we are afraid to ask other people to support God's work for fear of being turned down. But if God is leading us, we can ask boldly and leave the results up to God. Amen. From Nehemiah 5, verses 1 through 17, making past wrongs right. Now, although the famine and the heavy taxes did contribute to the Jews' situation, their problem was caused by the selfishness of some of God's own people. Their own Jewish countrymen were charging high interest rates and forcing the people into financial bondage. Selling fellow Jews was clearly forbidden. When we see any of our past sins still causing us trouble, we should do as Nehemiah did. He faced the problem head on, making specific plans to correct the problem immediately. Nehemiah also encouraged those involved to go on public record stating that they had decided to change their ways. This promise was made before the people and before God with serious consequences for those who did not follow through on their words. Now, if you are struggling with making past wrongs right, it's helpful to make your new commitment known to someone you trust because they can hold you accountable. Encourage this peace person to check up on you and see how well you are keeping your promises. From Nehemiah 7, verse 1 through 3, keep up your guard. After experiencing a great accomplishment, it is tempting to let down our guard. That is one thing, though, we dare not do. Nehemiah realized that the strong wall they had just completed was useless if the city gates were left open to attackers. He set guards in place with clear instructions designed to prevent any enemies from having an easy opportunity to get in. Similarly, my friends, if we allow the gates to our lives, our eyes, ears, and thoughts to remain unguarded, then we are inviting the enemy, Satan, to come in. We must keep up our guard, especially after a time of victory. From Nehemiah 8, 1 through 12, food for starving spirits. When Ezra and the Levites um, read and explained God's law, it was like a free banquet for starving people. Most of these people had been born and raised as captives in a foreign land, and many of them may never have heard the word of God read and explained. It is not surprising that their first response to hearing the truth of God was to weep. For the first time, perhaps, they recognized the sins of their fathers as well as their own. But Ezra and Nehemiah let the people know that this was a day of celebration. God had given them a new start. Their sadness was turned to gladness because the Lord would be their happiness and strength. When we allow God's work to speak to our hearts, often our first response is to be aware of our sins. And we all have them, my friends. We all are sinners. But when we realize that God has forgiven us of our sins, we can experience true freedom and true joy and true peace. Nehemiah 9, 1 through 37, telling it like it is. Religion at its worst is to stand in the presence of a holy God and tell him what good people we have been. This is a very dangerous place for anyone to stand because only God is holy and good. The Israelites realized that only after they had suffered many humiliations. 
Now, the theme of the prayer in this chapter is God's faithfulness to his word and to his people, even when his people had not been faithful to him. In our lives, confession of our sins often follows a time of difficulty, a time when we realize the seriousness of our sins. We should keep a hold on the reality that we are sinners, but God loves us enough to send his beloved son to die for our sins. Amen. Promises for us from the book of Nehemiah. The, this book reports Nehemiah's efforts to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and to reform the spiritual co um, commitments of the Jews. He tackled the wall first and then used the success of that project as a motivator for spiritual reform. The walls stayed built, but the spiritual reforms were more difficult to establish. Sometimes it is difficult to love God and establish habits of prayer and Bible study. Nehemiah, however, illustrates the importance of a life, a life committed to God and spiritual excellence. Every day, my friends, every day. So with that, uh, let us all join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So with that, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon each and every one of you with his favor and give you all his amazing peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is a gift from God, my friends. That is why they call today a present. Make the most of this beautiful day because this is is the day that the Lord has made. And let us all rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I hope you pulled a few pieces out of Ezra and Nehemiah. And um, as of now, we will see you on Monday. Um, we did lose another parishioner today. So I will um, have a funeral next week. I'm just not sure when, but just bear with me. Because I will be on here every time I can. Because I love and appreciate all of you guys. Um, and I, I need coffee with Christ. So you guys have a great weekend. God bless. And until Monday or next time, bye for now.